Children's ministry, we believe kids are essential. Ladies, there is, uh, they put on the Facebook page and whatnot, uh, the ladies' Facebook page, and, it just, and it's just in the app as well, uh, is Ladies Bible Study tomorrow night. So they're gonna, you guys doing that monthly, is that the plan? For now, we're going to figure out what we're starting. Awesome. So Ladies Bible Study is at my house, uh, or Amanda's house, uh, on 7 o'clock tomorrow, on Monday. So connect with Amanda if you have any other questions about that. Uh, we're, we're beginning our study on the benefits of salvation. And I kind of broke down into nine different, uh, nine different things that we're going to look at. And, uh, you know, group some together. Today we're going to talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness. And certainly forgiveness, uh, there's a lot that goes into that. And all these things that we talk about in regards to the benefits of salvation, there's a lot that goes into it. So not only... Maybe our first thought is, okay, if we're forgiven, it means we don't have to face the penalty that we deserve to pay. So if we are forgiven our wrongs, or forgiven our sins, forgiven our debt, we no longer have to take on the consequence. But there's also a change of identity that comes with forgiveness. All right? They're, you're viewed differently. You know, when you are forgiven for something wrong you've done, you're viewed differently by the person that has forgiven you. Just the, the you'll see kind of the running example. Uh, the running example I kind of will use is like the idea of a stain. Uh, it's the illustration that God uses in, uh, in Isaiah that we'll look at. So the idea of we have a stain, all right, on a brand new shirt, you know, you get an expensive one, it says like Supreme front of it, it costs like $38, you know, uh, and so th this is, or no, I always love when like you go and you get like a, like it's just like a white shirt or a gray shirt, there's nothing on it, but it's like Nike, you know, you know, $58 t-shirt, you know, like hanging up on like a nice thick, you know, thick uh, hanger, you're like, man, this guy's an expensive other shirt, uh, and you get, of course, right when you buy something like a little a little bit more expensive than you know you should have. You knew it was a little bit of a splurge. You weren't being a good steward of that money. Uh, you know you're staying at that. Like, very first opportunity, it's going to be like whatever you were eating drips on it. Uh, Amanda's the ultimate, just like immediately. She buys an immediate stain. Immediate stain. And it's always some kind of oil, oil based something. You know, so it's like, you know, even when you clean it up, you can still see the stain on it. And when it comes to stains, it actually doesn't matter if it's a, a, a small stain, like, oh, it's really, you know, it's only a half inch long, or a giant stain. A stain just stain, like, right when you see the stain, like, you see it everywhere you go, it, like, follows you everywhere in the room. It doesn't matter if the stain is small or if the stain is giant. A stain is a stain. All right? And the shirt becomes worthless. All right? It can only be discarded and burned with the other trash. All right? Unless the stain can be cleaned. Unless the stain is cleaned, the shirt is now valuable again. It can go back in the repertoire. Now, I wanted to use that word repertoire, but when I wrote it in, I, I wasn't even close enough in spelling to right-click it and have the correct spelling showed up. Like, I tried three different times to spell repertoire, and I couldn't even get my right-click to actually give me the correct spelling. So I know what word is here, but I'm embarrassed to show you. <laughs> now it's spelled. So it's now of use again. It can go back in the cycle. Uh, you can now use the shirt again when the stain is removed. But what you know what is always going to be amazing about us, and the reason why we, we have infomercials on cleaning products is you know it's the cleaning product that gets the attention. It's what gets the recognition. There's still OxyClean commercials. You know, and now we have all that cool, like, hydrophobic, like, sprays and, like, nothing will stick to this. Because that's what's amazing. And even if you're kind of one of those old school of, like, I have a club soda, vinegar, a rigorous wash. Like, you still, you have your formula. You have your, that's what gets the attention, is what cleans. So, uh, let's begin with our look at what God says in the Old Testament. We're going to follow a pattern uh, these next few weeks of what does the Old Testament have to say? What's the foreshadow? What did Jesus have to say in the Gospels? And then what does the New Testament kind of conclusion look like? Uh, so I'd love for you to either turn there. I'm not going to have the verses up on the screen. 
Uh, I want you to either use on, on the app, you'll see on Sunday morning, if you click the little button that says Sunday morning, you'll see sermon notes, and all the notes are there. You can take notes. Uh, sermon notes are there. Of course, you can just turn your Bible to Isaiah 118. Uh, Isaiah 118 says this, come now. You know this verse. You know this verse. You memorized it this morning. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. All right? So what he's describing here is your sin is a blot. Your sin is a stain. All right? The impossible kind of blood stain that is impossible to get out. All right, and now it has been washed white as snow. This is the picture that God starts painting back in the Old Testament. This thing that they can look forward to, something that doesn't even fully happen for hundreds of years until Jesus arrives. The promise of their sins being white clean. So we, we shouldn't just think of sin as like a crime. Our natural way of thinking about it, we tend to think about it very judicially. And, and I, I, do, I don't think that there's not a part for that. But uh, the idea that, okay, yeah, sin is a crime, and crime has to be punished. Uh, but the way we should oftentimes also think about sin uh, is that it's an offense. We have offended God. This is what God has asked us not to do. This is uh, the way R.C. Sproul put it, cosmic treason. We have committed treason against the creator of the universe, your creator, the one who designed your soul. He, you have offended him. And what God is doing is God is erasing the offense from your record and now views you differently. All right? He views you. The way he's going to view you is that your sins that were like this horrible stain, this blood stain, is now washed white as snow. This, this red light crimson blot on your record is now become <clears throat> white like wool. All right? It's been purified. But it's, it's the viewpoint that's now different. He's even saying, like, listen, I'm going to view you as pure. All right? We know we're not pure. We're sinners. But he's going to view us that way. And it just helps us to see the relationship side of this as well. When God forgives us, it's the kind of forgiveness like we want that we know isn't like really easy as a human. Like forgiveness is really difficult as a human being because like we say this phrase forgive and forget. I don't know, I don't forget anything. What are you talking about? I can't, I can't forget. Like how do I forget something? But we know this like, I, we have this picture of an ideal. The ideal is, yeah, when you forgive someone, you treat them as if they had not offended you. They had not wronged you. Even though we find this difficult as a human being, God is setting the standard that he's saying, when I forgive you, I treat you differently because I, I view you differently. Here's the illustration. You were just covered in this blot, this stain, but I view you as pure. You are pure in my sight. You are sinless in my sight. Not that you are sinless, but that you, I'm viewing this you this way. I'm treating you this way. All right? and, and this is how we can be thankful because we are forgiven, that we have been cleansed, we have been justified. So here's Jesus, all right? and, and this is Jesus' illustration that he uses when being questioned about forgiveness. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. Again, I put it in the uh, sermon notes as well in the app. But I'm going to begin reading a long passage here, uh, but great, great story. Jesus is the best Luke 7, 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at his table. And behold, a woman of the city. Uh, you know what that is. You know what that means, right? A woman of the city, one of those little walker, little street walkers. Uh, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the house, uh, reclining at the table of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointments. All right, so basically said something that's really expensive. This is, the container is expensive. We know what's ever in the container is expensive, okay? It was like container store expensive. Um, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet 
and anointed them with ointment. Now, many have attributed this to be Mary Magdalene. We don't know. There are several stories of prostitutes in Scripture that people are immediate to say, ooh, is that Mary Magdalene? The answer is maybe. We don't know enough information. We can't objectively say that. He does mention something that sounds like this is maybe her, but we don't know for sure, but possibly. Uh, began to, you know, wet her tears or using them to wipe with her hair, his feet. I mean, this is just very humbling. Very humbling. Uh, verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. All right, we, we talked about this a few months ago. Something that was really profound for me. I don't know if it was as profound for you, but I like it. Um, and when we talk about God's holiness, all right, he is so holy all right, that when unholy things touch him, they become holy. The, the previous understanding of the Jewish people, and the Pharisee in particular, would only have un understood holiness and unholiness as, yeah, if something unholy touches something holy, that holy thing becomes unholy. So the thing we usually do is determine like sicknesses. You know, if somebody has leprosy and touches someone who is clean that doesn't have leprosy, now that person has leprosy. And the same thing would be true in the temple. If a sinful person, you know, touches, you know, one of the little pieces on the table or the, the water jugs or that for them, that's now unholy. You're gonna have to get a different one. You've got to cleanse yourself. You step into water to cleanse yourself before you touch any of the holy instruments. Because unholy things make holy things unholy. And Jesus, you know, it starts getting foreshadowed in Isaiah, but Jesus gives us this living example of, yeah, that's actually not how it works with me. I'm so holy that when unholy things touch me, they become holy. When a leper touches him, he becomes clean. When the woman with bleeding touches Jesus, she becomes holy. She stops bleeding. So the idea of this unholy person touching Jesus from the Pharisees' eyes is, oh, she should, he should know. If he were really God, a, a messenger of God, he would know what kind of unholy thing is touching him and that he now has to go and get cleansed and all this. He doesn't seem to know he must not be holy. It's a misunderstanding of how holy Jesus is. All right, so I'll repeat what he says. If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Verse 40. Jesus answering said to him, and I picture, I think he really said this in his head, and Jesus is answering the thought that the guy had in his head. And it's like, well, did I say that out loud? It's like, well, no, technically, but I heard you. Uh, Jesus answering said to him, Simon, all right, and this is, don't think this is Simon Peter, this is a Pharisee named Simon. Simon, I have something to say to you. And he says, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, and the other owed 50 denarii. Just to put it in context, man, it's such a big swing on what, how much money are we talking about here. Uh, the answer is 500 denarii is somewhere between uh, 50 to 500 thousand dollars. It just depends on how you view it. Is a denarii a day's wage or a week's wage? A soldier would make a denarii every day, uh, but the average person would more like make a denarii every week. So 500 denarii might be like 500 weeks of work. All right, so maybe 10 years worth of work for a soldier. It would be like over a year's worth of work. But a year and a half worth worth. So it, it's a lot of money. 50 denarii, that's not nothing. All right, so that's maybe like a month, somewhere between a month and a year's worth worth. So that's somewhere between five and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Just get, obviously, you can see the scale. The person that owes 500, that's a huge sum of money. 500 denarii is a huge sum of money. 50, it is a lot of money. Not crazy amount. That would be like normal student debt. Is the 50 denarii 500 is like, what? Why would you go to Harvard if you have a scholarship kind of money? Uh, Simon, uh, all right, so 105, 50 denarii, 10500. When they could not pay, he canceled debts of both. Now, here comes the question. Now, which of them will love him more? So someone owes 500 denarii, 
huge sum of money. Some of it was 50 denarii, 50 denari, a lot of money. But he answers, when the money lender forgives both debts, who is more thankful? Who loves the money lender more? Who is more jubilant? Who is more excited? Verse 43, Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Yeah, common sense. That makes sense, right? You've judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. All right, it's probably showing that this Pharisee is open, he's willing to listen to Jesus, but he's not going overboard to treat Jesus like he's a special guest. He kind of views, he's a Pharisee, like welcoming this traveling itinerant rabbi into his house. That's the nice move. He isn't treating Jesus like he would if the high priest or a Roman official was showing up at his house. That guy would get the red carpet. So Jesus is saying, you didn't roll out the red carpet for me. I'm not offended, but you didn't roll out the red carpet. You didn't kiss me. You didn't want the world to see that we're friends, right? You didn't want to, you didn't want to stop and be like, look who came to my house. All right? You kind of just welcomed me in. All right? She wiped her feet with tears and wiped them with my hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed, uh, she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she has loved much. But he who is forgiven loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say amongst themselves, who is this? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The cleansed is amazed by how dirty they see themselves. Your thankfulness, your, your response to the person who cleaned you is, is only going to be, you're only going to be as amazed as recognizing how dirty something is. You know, when you, when you, if you got some kind of stain on your shirt and was like, Oh, man, that's impossible to get out. <gasps> and your mom, with just a little bit of spit on her thumb, gets it out. And it's like, that's your mom's spit. Right, like, you're amazed because you're like, I didn't think that was possible. If it's something that you're like, oh, no, that's easy to get out. No big deal. And when it cleans out, okay, yeah, no big deal. I, I mean, I've done that a million times. That's really easy to get out. It's, it's a washable arm. It's no big deal. Uh, the Pharisee viewed his sins, which... Probably in the scheme of humanity, like when you compare, if you were to put a row of human beings, sure, this, this Pharisee's probably not a crazy, horrible sinner. We're not going to treat him like he's the most hypocritical person on the planet. He's probably a generally good, nice person. All right? A generally, we didn't murder anybody. He's been pretty obedient to the law. You know, his sins, like if we're stacking them up, in comparison to other people, probably has a small stack. It's probably a small stain, all right, if we're going to do it in comparison. Here's this woman, huge stack of sins, you know, very obvious stains, all right? And here, the, the, her, the problem between these two people is she recognized herself as a sinner and that she needed forgiveness. And she is begging and pleading and crying and doing everything she knows to do to just ask for Jesus' forgiveness and he grants it. And here's this guy who doesn't ask for forgiveness, <laughs> doesn't think he needs it. He doesn't think he needs it. This is the problem that we face today. When we're sharing the gospel with people, there's going to be people that recognize they need forgiveness. And they're going to be blown away that God's word is crystal clear that Jesus will forgive them no matter what. No matter what they have done, he will forgive you. The greater sinner is going to be more jubilant all right, than the person that's like, oh, I mean, yeah, I guess I probably could use some forgiveness. Yeah, I'll take a little bit of forgiveness, I guess. Uh, if they don't recognize their sin, that's the problem. So the Pharisees in particular didn't recognize their sins. I think it's a problem of a lot of Americans. I think a lot of friends you have don't recognize their sin. They don't see their sin as cosmic treason. 
They don't see their sin as worthy of hell. All right? And if they look at the little, you know, I'm sure I've lied sometimes. I'm sure I've, you know, you know, have taken God as number one. There's been like some you know, light, you know, light adultery. And there has been some, you know, and, and they just kind of go through this list. And if you were to, like, look at the Ten Commandments, it's something that, like, uh, uh, the Living Waters people rate comfort and different people like that, Kirk Campbell do, and I like it. Uh, that they, like, go through the list of Ten Commandments, and they're like, okay, so God has been number one for life. You've taken the Lord's name in vain. You've um, looked at the woman who loves to commit adultery. You've hated someone in your heart. You've committed murder. Uh, you've stolen something. You've so, like, okay, you're a lying, thieving, murderous adulterer, and you're going to stand before God and say, I'm a pretty good person? Like, you've literally broken every Ten Commandments. You broke them all. That's just the first ten. He's got a lot more things to say after that. He just kind of gave some highlight reel stuff to make sure you would recognize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. The cleaner, when it comes to Jesus, you know, whether, whether we're looking at Jesus, whether we're looking at OxyClean, all right, it shouldn't matter the size of the stain. If, if OxyClean can clean something this big, it can clean something this big. If Jesus can forgive this much sins, he can forgive this much sins. The cleaner, the person who is doing the cleaning, the person doing the purifying, it doesn't actually matter how big the stain is. It doesn't matter how much the dead is. Right? It doesn't matter you know, how bad the sin is. All right? if, if the cleaner is able to clean, he can do it. Here, they recognize when people saw the strangeness of Jesus, this, this human that they're looking at, saying he forgives sins. They didn't yet understand that he was more than human, that he was God, and only God can forgive sins. Correct. And yet here is Jesus forgiving sins. So Jesus is taking the role of, of Yahweh that they would have understood him as, that he is forgiving sins just like God. He is forgiving sins. Because, yeah, it's easy for Jesus to forgive sins. He is the cleaner. Uh, I'll use an illustration. Because I, I, I do think judicial illustrations do make sense here when we talk about forgiving of sins. Uh, I, I, have, I have gotten... Some speeding tickets over the years. I have just gotten one recently. I don't think it was my fault. Uh, I, will be, I will be defending my position in court. Uh, <laughs> I have to, uh, I have a CDL, I have to go to court because I, I can't get points on my license uh, or I lose my CDL. So, uh, and, and so I gotta go to court and, so just, and, and every time the same thing always happens. I walk up, I plead no contest, they make me pay a fine and I'm good to go. Uh, I haven't gotten a ton. That's how it goes. And I'm thankful. Like, I'm thankful, no doubt. But honestly, my consequence isn't that great. My CDL isn't actually what my pays for my living. Uh, so I only keep it so that I can drive the bus to Disney World and other events I want to go to with, with the college students. Uh, and so I, uh, uh, you know, it's not my livelihood. You know, the consequence is pretty low. You know, the worst case scenario is like, you know, I gotta pay the full fine. Oh, no, actually the worst case scenario is having to do the, the, the driving school. That's worst case scenario. <laughs> so when I get forgiven, I'm thankful. I'm like, thank you. Yeah, I'm you know, but I, I'm not bawling because I'm not standing before him as a murderer. If, if you are being accused of murder, all right, and you think it's justified, but you are, you're standing before a judge and you killed someone and you're being accused of manslaughter where you're saying, I think it's an accident, but they're bringing charges against you and you are just like, please. And if you hear forgiving from the judge, oh, the, the emotion, the thought of I might be going to prison away from my family, being forgiven in that instance, oh, I, maybe I'll cry for the third time. I mean, like, uh, it would be huge if I was facing like a real consequence, like a death penalty. I would be more thankful. But again, when we understand this word forgiveness, and the, and the fancy <coughs> Christian word we would use here is, is justification. Justification. All right? And it's the idea of being in right standing with God. That sin, we're in this, we, we have offended God. Righteousness, all right, justification, being forgiven, is that we are now in good standing with God, in right standing. So let's use the same example of a judge. I'm being accused of manslaughter. I was in an accident. They say it was reckless. Uh, they're accusing me of manslaughter. I'm going to go to prison if I'm found convicted. And I'm standing before the judge, and I find out it was his son I killed in the car accident. I am in huge 
trouble. All right, now we would hope to be in a justice system would be like, that, that, that seemed like conflict of interest. And the judge is like, I'm the one that decides if it's conflict of interest and I decide it's not, I'll be fair. And I'm like, oh, man. I should have hired a lawyer. <laughs> Pay your lawyer. Uh, and I'm standing before this judge whose son I killed. I have offended him. This is not just him judging the law to see that I hit a certain standard of the law. There's something I have done to offend him. I, you know, now all of a sudden they're throwing around the word hate crime. They think I've committed a hate crime against his son. <gasps> I have offended God. I, when we sin, Whatever we even want to call a small sin, which is just usually our own way of justifying our behavior, God calls sin sin. Certainly when we compare sins of human beings, there's greater sins worse sin. But when we compare it to God, who is perfect, who is holy, sin is sin. Sin has offended God. Sin is demanding of punishment. Now the only time we use this word justification, I tend to think it's like in Microsoft Word, so we're right now in the category of sin, but when we are right justified, when we are, when he clicks right, our name is now moved to this other column. So here's Joe's name, and it's manslaughter and hate crime and lots of speeding tickets. And, you know, here's this, and, uh, just make sure you know, like, I didn't get that, like, my ticket was uh, for going 32 in a, a, a school zone, which I didn't think the school zone was actually being enacted at that time. Doesn't matter. No children. No children involved. No children involved. <laughs> no children. This is not a fake school zone. It's a fake zone. Uh, so here's Joe, all his crime. All right? But with God, every thought I've ever thought is on that list. All right? Uh, at least the bad ones. Uh, all the, you know, all the things I've done wrong, all on this list. And now what he does in justification is he's saying, I'm going to take your name, highlight it, write justify. And he puts me in this list over here, which only Jesus is listed. It's listed as you know, the Son of God, righteous, good. And all of a sudden, like all these characteristics when my name is brought up, if he forgives me, if he justifies me, I am, my, the list of my crimes are, you know, his son and righteous and good and perfect. He is seeing his son's record when he sees me. He is seeing his, his son when he sees me. Now, a lot of times people use the word justification. To, you've maybe heard this little expression, just as if I've ever sinned. Like justification is just as if I've never sinned. I don't like love that. I don't hate it, but I don't love it. Uh, because I, I think a clear view of ourselves as a sinner, I think understanding that I am a sinner that has been saved by grace and forgiven is probably a better way of understanding myself. I, I know that the way God views me is his son, he views me as perfect, he views me as sinless, and yet I want my actions to reflect my new nature. And so I, I want to recognize that, like, man, I am evil and desperately wicked if I continue, if I'm just doing my natural stuff. I have to choose to follow God and follow him if I have any desire to actually do what is good, which is now available to me. So forgiveness is complete forgiveness. It forgives all future debt as well. When he forgives us, we think about this judge who has forgiven. His, his gavel goes down, you are forgiven. Innocent. That innocent that God the judge is declaring on us is not just innocence up to that point. Like if you go before a judge and you get declared innocent, we probably see it happen a lot in our, in our justice system is someone is declared innocent and they go out and do that exact crime again. They're like, oh, I guess they did do that. <laughs> in God's declaration of innocent, he's not just declaring you from your actions to the past to the present. When God forgives you, he is forgiving your sins from the past to the present and your sins from the present to the future. Because God has a view that this, you know, this judge here doesn't have. The view that he has is an eternal view. 
And he can see your entire life. You know, conception to death. He sees your entire existence. And when he forgives you, as when you trust Jesus as your Savior, and he promises to justify you or forgive you, when he forgives you, he is forgiving everything you've done, including the things you haven't done yet or even imagined doing yet. You know, 16 years from now, when you're going to do something really bad, God knew you were going to do that and forgave you anyway. When he saved you, he saved you with your future sins in mind. He saved you anyway. He forgave your future sins. There's a, uh, and this, so this gets us to like, okay, what does this now mean for me? What, what does that then mean? There's a, a movie I actually haven't seen, which is really weird to say. I feel like any movie I ever bring up is, of course I've seen this movie. I've never actually seen this movie. Uh, it's a movie called Love Story. It came out years ago. And there's a line in here you know. There is a line from this movie you've heard. And the line is, love means never having to say you're sorry. Have you heard that line before? Love means never true. having to say you're sorry. What? It's not true. That's a terrible, <laughs> terrible expression. There's no way that expression, like, there is no scenario in which that expression is true. <laughs> that love is never having to say you're sorry. And someone that does a lot of, you know, marriage counseling stuff, that is a terrible, <laughs> terrible line. Uh, it's definitely not a biblical one. And so knowing Jesus forgave you completely, if anyone could say that line, we could say that, okay, it doesn't work with human relationships, but does that line work with our relationship with God? Does our line, if God forgave us, including future sins, and he knew I was going to commit this sin on Tuesday, do I even need to say I'm sorry? Like, do I even need to ask for forgiveness of that one? He knew I was going to do it, right? Like, he knew what he saved me. Like, do I even, like, you know, is God saying, like, you know, my, you know, complete and ultimate justification means never having to say you're sorry? The answer is no. The answer is no. He says, yeah, you better say you're sorry. All right? New Testament example, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. I'd love for you to turn there. Uh, also there, yeah, 1 John 1, 5 to 10. Now, there is some arguments that scholars have on this verse. Uh, of is this verse talking about salvation or is this verse uh, talking about our after salvation relationship with Christ? I am really strong that it is the latter, that this is talking about someone who is saved. I think everything, the, fir the first couple verses leading up to that, everything is screaming, this is a saved person, and telling a saved person what they should do is what I believe. Now, again, there is some discrepancy, and I apologize. I, I usually like, when I say controversial things, I usually like to talk with Pastor Al to see, does he agree with me, or does he not want to show up this Sunday? <laughs> uh, we, I, I won't say things that Pastor Al or Pastor Jason totally disagree on, or I'll share two points of view if, if necessary. I didn't talk about it, but I don't think it's, it's not going to be a huge deal. Um, 1 John 1, 5 through 10 says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. God's perfect. God's perfect. If we say we have fellowship with him, with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves. You just lied and you just sinned. And the truth is not in us. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So verse 9 is kind of the famous verse of this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What this is talking about, everything to me is talking about this fellowship that we have with God. This fellowship, he's not dealing with the eternal consequences here. He is talking about fellowship, walking with God. All right, and he says, if you sin, if you have darkness, you can't fellowship with God. 
If you have this unconfessed sin in your life, how can you think you can walk God step in step? He's light. Light is heading in this direction. God's heading in this way. If you're sinning, you're heading in a different direction. You can't say you're walking with God if you're walking in different directions. All right? So you're either in fellowship with God, going his way, doing things his way, or you're living a life of sin. But if you confess your sins, and the word confession, always remember, means this idea of saying the same thing. To confess something says, I'm going to say the same thing as what God is saying. So is God ever saying like, ah, oh, it was just like a little white lie. It's actually not. If we are diminishing, like really I don't feel like I had a choice. I think my only option was to sin in this case. That's not, con confession is saying, God, I, I was wrong. And I'm sorry. This was wrong. No excuses. It was wrong. I have nothing to say here. It was wrong. It was wrong. I'm sorry. I, 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 I've offended you. I'm sorry. Conf saying the same thing that God says about sin. If we confess our sins, what is he faithful and just to forgive us? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right? this, we know that he has forgiven our sins in this cosmic tale that we will spend an eternity in heaven. All right? But while we're here on this earth, there is still this fellowship that can be broken. The fellowship can be broken between us and God because of sin. All right? And if we want to stay in fellowship with God... We will confess our sins. All right, this is, this is I, I think, the way I like to think about it. I love these little videos. Uh, you maybe have seen different things like this, like these little hydrophobic things. It's amazing. Yeah. They just pour water on it. Okay. So this is what I like to think about <laughs> when I think about God's forgiveness. Sure, that sin isn't going to stick to us. All right? But at the end of the day, a person walked up to me with ketchup. Oh, I don't like ketchup. Someone comes up to me with ketchup and like throws it on my shirt. All right? Or like the, I, maybe like, I think maybe like one of the worst things you can do. Like in, like, like in sports when you see things like, there's plenty of, like if you see guys like punching at each other and some people look at like, I'm like, oh, I cannot punch at each other. Don't worry about punching. Like, yeah, they're just angry. They're fine. If a man walks up to another man and like spits in his face, it's going down. It's going down. The, the benches are going to clear. Someone's going to get hurt. All right? People punch it. People punch it. Don't worry. Don't worry. But guys, guys in the other game, they can, they can punch each other for 30 minutes in the other game. Like, hey, good game, bro. Good game. They can hug it out and they're fine. But some, someone like spits in your face. All right? That's bad. That's, that, that, that's not going to go well. That's not going to go well. But you can look at it, but it's just spit, it's just water. Get look, you spit on my face, look. Let's go. Let's go. It wipes right off. What? This sin, look, and yeah, it wipes right off. But what you can't ignore is that a person just walked up to you and, and like just squirted mustard and ketchup on you, or a person just walked up to you and spit in your face. That's the offense. That's the offense. The fact that it didn't stick and rolls off, that doesn't matter. That actually doesn't matter. When it comes to God, when we, if we have truly trusted Jesus as our Savior, and he has forgiven us, there is no doubt. The sin is not going to stick. The sin is not going to stick. But there's the offense we just spit in the face of God. We, we have just poured mustard or ketchup. We, we, have, we have blatantly done something offensive to God. And now we know better. Before we were saying, like, we didn't know better. We didn't know what we were doing. Now that we're saying we know better. Like this isn't something like, you know, a, a kid accidentally, you know, flicking his, you know, little mushed up peas on you. You don't know better. All right? You don't know. All right? This is you know better. You knew this was wrong and you did it anyway. That's the offense. But here's what God is saying to that offense. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins. It cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment. Let's close our eyes bow our heads. First question is always, always the same. Have you been eternally forgiven? Have you been forgiven? And here's what scripture, if, if we believe in our heart, confess with mouth, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. 
We recognize ourselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. It's just in the best way we know how. Say, Jesus, will you save me? Jesus, forgive me. I know you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I trust in you and you alone to save me. If you haven't done that, do that the best way you know how. I'm happy to talk with you afterward as well and help you, you know, articulate that to God. But it's this heart change that occurs. It's this, this cry out to God. It's that, it's that woman, you know, in the best way she knew how, just taking perfume and wiping it on Jesus' feet, using her tears to, you know, clean his feet, using her hair to dry it up. Just the best way she knew how to recognize Jesus and need your forgiveness. Because my second question is, do you recognize any sin in your life that you've been flippant with? I feel like I see a lot of believers, and maybe a lot of believers at different times in their life, who are flippant with sin. Just kind of like, yeah, Jesus will forgive me. <laughs> oh, Jesus forgave that. Uh, I agree. I can look back in the past and say Jesus will forgive that. But I would never want to look forward to sin and saying like, oh, well, Jesus will forgive that. Uh, I certainly don't want to treat it. I certainly don't want to treat it flippantly, knowing what Jesus had to go through for that forgiveness. I want to see my sin the way that God sees sin. I don't want to view my sin the way that others view sin. If I compare myself to this world, oh yeah, I always look like a bunch of roses. But when I compare myself to Jesus, that's a better picture of who I am. And I just want to give you a moment here in the quiet of this moment. Do you have any unconfessed sin? Is there anything that's been going in your life recently that you just need to say, God, I'm sorry? Here's the comfort. You know he's going to forgive you. You know he's going to forgive you. What an exciting, what an exciting thing. What an exciting thing to be forgiven. To know that he views you differently. That he's not going to, he doesn't lord it over you. He doesn't keep bringing it up. He doesn't, he isn't going to, you know, hold that over your head. That when he forgives, he washes you white as snow. He cleanses you completely. He purifies you totally. So we just give you a moment. God reveal anything in us that needs to be confessed. Jesus, forgive me. Those errant thoughts, those flesh filled moments. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you that it's complete and total. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. I pray.